Good day, everyone. Welcome back to Mike's Radio Repair and Restoration. And I have a new project on the bench today. Um, not necessarily new to me, but probably new to a lot of you folks out there. This is a RME DB22A. And you might ask, well, what is that? A lot of folks haven't seen one of these. Um, it's a pre-selector, and it's made by uh, Radio Manufacturing Engineering. I believe they're originally located in Illinois. And this pre-selector goes in front of your receiver, so the antenna feeds into it and feeds back out of it to your receiver. And it acts, um, it has a, quite an impact on, uh, on the receiver. Um, it acts as a little bit of an amplifier, um, so there's some gain there, but it increases the selectivity of your radio if you can imagine that, you know, if you put up a 100-foot random wire antenna, there are a lot of signals being captured by that wire that are being presented to the radio. Um, and this can be very daunting for the mixer. It's very uh, loading, if you will. The mixer can fill up with noise and, and other radio products that make the radio sensitivity not so particularly great. Also, um, some radios don't necessarily have an RF amp before their front end or antenna coils. Um, there's also the issue of images, which we're going to get into later. Um, so this focuses on a very narrow section of a band that you tune to. The coils in it are very sharp. So what gets presented to your receiver is only really very narrow band around the received frequency. Um, and it makes the receiver much more sensitive. It cuts way down as long as you don't turn the gain up too much. cuts the, the noise level or the noise floor for the receiver way down. And it makes receiving um, very low level stations quite possible. And I'm going to get into a demonstration once this is repaired and back and and service again this is my own unit i've taken it out of service for a repair um <clears throat> this gizmo was originally released to the u.s army and i'm going to put up a um a telegram a western union telegram from the army um i believe they were talking about an african campaign and how much of a difference this unit really made and they were thanking the people of uh RME for uh, building this unit. So uh, I believe there's a community section on my um, uh, channel where I've posted a copy of this telegram that you can go to after this video and read it uh, in its entirety. But it's really very an impressive telegram and it's an impressive unit. Um, we'll have a look at the schematic in a minute. This one here I got a while ago and I restored it. It works well, except for one thing. There is a cut-in, cut-out switch, so you can go directly to the antenna and bypass this unit, or you can run the signal through this unit. And there's a typical wafer type of a switch in the back. It's a four-pole contact switch, and it's pretty much worn out. It's had uh, many different types of horrible cleaners sprayed on it that have made the phenolic soft. Um, the uh, little brilliant brass contacts have lost their spring. So the switch is done. I've tried everything that I can do to resurrect it. And so why I have it out here is what I'm going to do is I'm going to, instead of having uh, a regular mechanical switch, two of the four poles on the switch are still okay. So I'm going to use those two poles to actuate a relay and the relay is going to do the changeover. I've got a bunch of these relays, about a half a dozen of them um, that are very low resistance and they've got a great way to screw it down and mount with the tabs here. So I'm going to use that as a changeover relay. And what I'm going to do is this coil on this relay is 12 volts DC. And uh, I have, a, of course, a 6.3 volt filament 
source inside. So I'm going to create a voltage doubler. I've got some 1N914 diodes. I've got some 47 uh, uh, microfarad capacitors at 50 volts. I've got some terminal blocks here. So the idea is to create a voltage doubler that's going to take my, uh, uh, my 6.3 volts up uh, to the point and convert it to DC to the point where I'm going to drive the relay. Now, one of the things about using voltage doubler circuits is they don't put out a lot of current. Um, they're not very uh, all solid performers, if you want, if you will. They can the voltage can sag quite a bit. Like I wouldn't be surprised if I saw somewhere between sixteen and eighteen volts open out of the output of this voltage doubler, and then maybe drop down to 12, 11 or twelve volts. Um, when you engage it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, just very quickly tie the components together with jumpers and test it out just to make sure that uh, it's got enough uh, current to drive the relay without heating or problems or, or, or being soft. So that's first. But let's take a look at the schematic of this uh, unit here. Uh, um, it's a very simple design and uh, it really made a difference. And they're forgotten about. Uh, I don't know many people except maybe the tube guys know this stuff. And uh, the, the guys who are long in the tooth have been doing this for a while. But most of the newer radio amateurs and shortwave listeners don't recognize this device, device or know it. Um, but uh, I really enjoy it. And like I say, when I get this one done and repaired, we're going to do a demonstration to show you just how well this unit can really work. So let's take a look at the schematic now. Okay, so here we're looking at uh, the uh, DB22A schematic. These are the antenna inputs, and the antenna feeds into this first line of coils. These coils are much sharper than ones you would find in an average receiver. So you maybe find that this is only 5 or 10 kilohertz wide, if that at all. So it scrapes out a lot of other co-located noise. Um, and interference. So what gets presented to your mixer um, is a, a cleaner signal. So we go into a first amplifier, and we go into another set of filter coils, into a yet another amplifier, and a last set of filter coils. So we can take our signal, and we can strip out a lot of the noise, amplify it, and present it to the receiver. Now, as you can see, there's also a gain control, so you can turn the, the gain on the first RF tube up. This, of course, here is the basic power supply. But another thing that was good for uh, the Army during World War II with this uh, device is we learned in uh, our basic radio theory that there is an oscillator running inside, and it runs at different frequencies depending upon where you're tuning. And also the IF runs at 455 kilohertz. And whether you like it or not, that signal, those signals generated by the internal oscillator, uh, the VFO and the I IF, are actually radiated through the antenna a little bit where the enemy might be able to pick you up. So this unit stops that radiation so you're not sending your signal back out over your own antenna where the uh, uh, a bad guy or an enemy can uh, track you down or figure out where you're operating from. So this. Pretty simple, um, very sharp coils are what they call high Q, and you can look that up. Uh, the Q of a resonant tank circuit is how sharp it tunes, whether it's very broad or very low Q, or if it's very sharp, a very narrow tune, um, then it's called high Q, and you can, you can look that up. That's a, a basic principle. But we've got the three sets of coils, which are tuned by our gang capacitor here. And we've got a band switch on the unit as well so that we can switch in the different bands. So it's not a complex unit, but it certainly functions very, very well. This is a pretty basic circuit. This is the voltage doubler I'll be using to uh, power the relay. <coughs> very simply, we have our 6.3 volt AC source from the... Uh, filament supply for the unit. It gets rectified and doubled through the diodes and capacitors. Um, for the folks who want an in-depth 
explanation on how a voltage doubler works. I'll be posting a link uh, uh, on our uh, Facebook page um, so that you can read up in depth on how a voltage doubling works. But this is the uh, two diodes, two capacitors that we'll be soldering into the, uh, the uh, terminal blocks. So we've mocked up the uh, circuit diagram here with a couple of 1N914s and a couple of uh, 47 uh, microfarad uh, electrolics. Uh, we're tapped into the uh, DB22A 6.5 AC filament voltage. And uh, we're going to see what uh, open voltage is, no load on this doubler. And we're going to see what the load is and if it can drive that relay um, um, satisfactorily. We're just going to turn this on. Uh, you can't see that, but uh, up on my uh, shelf here, my uh, voltmeter is registering about 6.7 AC volts. And open no load voltage coming off the doubler is showing 17.02. So let's give this a try here now. Ooh, that's a good solid click. And that's pretty typical. So uh, just over 11 volts under load. That's in my opinion, that's a good solid drive for that relay. So we can use this circuit. I'd say that's all right with me. So open, again, as I said before, uh, voltage sag is pretty typical with this uh, voltage doubler and uh, current isn't great, but you know what, it works. I don't know if you can hear that relay tick or even see it. Okay, there's a better a better view. You can uh, see the action of the relay. And that's working quite well. So that's what we're gonna do. So uh, this is the uh, chassis side here and you can see it's very simple with the three tubes. And all of the tubes are shielded, and this is our ganged capacitor. There isn't any real room on the underside of the chassis to uh, mount a, an extra relay. So I'm thinking that this relay is going to wind up going here. And I've got some of these terminal blocks that I'll probably drill a hole. And I'm out to them here. This is where I'll place my voltage doubler. And I'll probably drill holes in the chassis. Uh, put a rubber grommet in and bring some wires up from underneath. I've got to bring the antenna switch over leads and I've got to bring up a, uh, an AC run to the voltage doubler from the transformer. So uh, I'm thinking that's uh, what I'm going to do now. I'm going to get that done and drilled and mounted and uh, um, we'll come back. So here's some of the drilling and mechanical work done. I have mounted the uh, two terminal blocks here and this is where the diodes and capacitors are going to go for the voltage doubler. I've added this grommet to bring power up. The 6.3 filament voltage power will come up and I'll probably take supply lines back down for the relay through there to hit the switch underneath. I've added another grommet. I've turned this relay around from my original idea. Um, I've added another grommet for other wires to come up for the actual antenna switching portion. Um, and it's not too close to this tube. This tube doesn't get very hot at all. I've let it run for a little while and there was no significant heat worry or transfer to this uh, plastic cover. So this is all bolted down with some nice little Allen um, bolts and there's nuts on the underneath with lock washers. <clears throat> so the next thing to do is to start wiring this. DC is in and done now. The uh, voltage doubler and the two diodes and the capacitor or the relay is mounted down. Everything's put down with some nice hardware. So I have all of the relay engagement circuit done. Um, I haven't put the antenna uh, leads to this relay yet. So I just want to make sure mechanically and electronically the relay works. Um, what I did was I the old switch that uh, was giving me trouble, I removed it. I soaked it in isopropanol alcohol to remove years of sprayed on some kind of a really cleaner to get it up as much out of the phenolic as I could cleaned it up and I've tied all four pads together um, to drive the relay. Two of the contacts of the four weren't very good. They were giving me trouble 
and two of them are quite good, but all four are tied together to drive the relay. So current through it shouldn't be an issue at all because it's very negligible. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn it on. We'll see the, the, the lights come on. And then we'll uh, try the uh, the cut-in, cut-out switch, and we should see the relay go. So here we go. We turn it on. There we got lights here now. So when I turn the cut-in, cut-out, oh, there we go. I don't know if you can hear that. Might even be able to see it. Top wafer on the. That's working dandy. That's going to be certainly a very good fix, I believe. All right, so the next step is to uh, just wire the in and out antenna leads, and then we can put this unit back in the case and put it back into service. Antenna's wired up. All that's left to do is to put it in the case. I think once I put it in the case, uh, I'm probably going to give it a, an alignment, although it's been aligned recently, I think with all the jostling around and uh, new stuff. I think an alignment's in order, and then we'll uh, we'll get to testing it. Example one of the DB22 in service. We're on the AM broadcast band. We have a station we can barely hear. The DB22A is not in circuit, but you can just barely hear the station. Let's switch the 22 into circuit. It's going to take a while right now. Now the radio station becomes copyable. Without it. It's hardly copyable, so it makes quite a difference. You can see when we turn the DV, we can pick up our radio station, our best signal. Without it, we're not copyable. With it, we can copy quite a bit. You can see the difference in the S meter. So without it, we're just riding like 9S units, 10 over, full of noise and barely copyable radio station. When we turn it on, we're now floating over 20, 20 S units. It's a lot of noise still, but nevertheless, the station is now copyable. Here's example number two. We've got a noisy radio station that's copyable, but it's noisy. We hear a lot of static. We switch the 22 in, and the static pretty much disappears. So that, that station becomes quite listenable. Quite a difference. Out. In. Example number three, AM broadcast band again. There's a station in there, but I can't hear it. Let's turn this on. There it is. Now I can completely hear it. Take it out, and it's gone. So this worked out well. My RME DB22A is back in service, uh, working in fine style. Um, I'm never really wild about doing such a big modification like this to uh, an older unit. Putting a big relay in and uh, voltage doubler is kind of a big modification. I would have preferred to keep it closer to stock if I could have. But unfortunately, the uh, wafer switch that was worn out in the back, um, I just was unable to find a spare. So this is what I did to put it back in service. Um, as you can see through the examples, the unit is actually very useful, and I consider this a daily driver for me when I'm tuning around the bands or listening to shortwave. If I find a station that I want to listen to, but there's a bit of noise in it, um, I can switch in the uh, 22 and clean it up, which is a very nice feature. Um, one thing I did find, and I was surprised, after I got this relay modification done, I put the unit back in the case, and it refused to turn on. And uh, that kind of shocked me. So I pulled it back out of the case and started poking around. 
Um, long story short, uh, I found somebody had replaced the, uh, the gain control, which has also got the off and on switch on the back of it. They replaced that a long ago, and uh, the solder joints on the back of the 120-volt switch were really poor, and they were cold joints. In fact, they were so poor, I touched one wire and it fell off. I didn't notice this before when I restored it. Shame on me, I guess. Um, but it was hidden pretty good. Uh, nevertheless, poking around in the circuit allowed me to find out what was going on and clean up those solder joints. So, as I said, this is a useful daily driver to me, and uh, I hope you enjoyed coming along for the ride. Please check out the original Western Union telegram that's posted on the community section of the website. You can see the full version of it there, probably a little bit more readable than what uh, I had posted. So once again, thanks for coming along, and um, we'll look forward to seeing you in the next video. Please like, please subscribe, let's build a community, um, and consider joining our Facebook page. We'll post the link to that below in the description. See you on the next show. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile found...